Every trained soldier knows that perching at the highest available peak will give you the best vantage point to see potential targets and incoming threats. Not only does it give you the best position, but it also gives you a sense of godliness, where similar to Zeus, you can send lightning strikes down to the mortals below. This was the exact mindset of Charles Whitman, the 25-year-old former Marine who held a vendetta against life itself. This Texas Tower shooter's motto may well have been, when life gives you lemons, grab a Remington 6mm Model 700 bolt action center fire deer rifle and shoot everyone in sight. I like the episodes where we drink wine. <laughs> Some wine, some wine drunks. Yeah, wine remember tipsies? the second episode? Yeah, Murder and Marple. That is one of my favorite episodes. It really of all time. still is, and I just remember drinking a whole bottle of wine. Surprise shots! Surprise shots! We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. You know the word surprise shot actually goes along quite nicely with our episode tonight. So as I said, the word surprise shot goes along perfectly. And does anyone want to guess what the surprise shot was? Raspberry pucker. Mm-hmm. Because tonight... Good old cough syrup. Tonight, guys, we are talking about a terrifying true story of Charles Whitman. Do you know who that is? I've heard the name. You may have even seen the Netflix video, but we're reading from a book by Ryan Green, which he's a true crime author. We've used his... We've used his books in the past, and the book is called The Texas Tower Sniper. Oh. The story, the true story of Charles Whitman. So do you know anything about this story? No. The only Texas Tower Sniper I know about is Lee Harvey Oswald. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that was in Texas, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Dallas. Dallas. Actually, it wasn't him that killed. That, that's just what round earthers think. <laughs> <laughs> So you, so you are grassy knoll man. <laughs> yeah. But he, um, he, uh, is he the basketball player? Who? Who who's the basketball no, player um, that was that said he was a flat earther for a Kyrie while? Kyrie Irving. Yeah, but oh, no, okay. he got on. I think it was Joe Rogan or something, and explained. It was on that it movie. It was in that yeah, social yeah. change movie. Kyrie Irving was. He's the NBA NBA player who famously believed the Earth was flat for a while, mm-hmm. and um. In that Social Dilemma movie, he talked about how, like, he he was watching videos on YouTube and he was, you know, kept on being recommended, like, videos. And he went down the, quote, rabbit hole. And that's how he, for a time, was a flat earther. Yeah, he's also, you know, not on my favorite people list. Why? Because he was a Boston Celtic and oh he God. promised us that he was coming back and then he like gave up in the season, played like crap and then left us. But now we have Kemba Walker, so we're we're fine. Well, also he was a flat earther for a time, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but not he, the wisest. He, he is an offensive savant though. He is <laughs> very good. Tonight we are talking about Charles Whitman. I'm going to call him Charlie from now on because he's actually Charles Whitman Jr., so little Charlie. And he is the Texas Tower Sniper. And there is a really great true crime documentary. It was on Netflix for a while. It is... On YouTube right now. Yes, on YouTube. You can get it for free. Some people have put it on there for free. But it is done in the style of old archival footage mixed with... Some sort of cartoonish animation. Oh, the animation one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's really good because the animation uses the real sound clips from the actual day that this happened. Hmm. And it's really well done. And they use like actors for the cartoons, but then at the end they like bring in the actual people today. It's really, really well done. Yeah, it's a really it's good documentary. Really good. I remember hearing about it, and I don't remember if that's one that I saw. We, I know we talked about it at, once on the show. Yeah, so the book we're reading tonight is The Texas Tower Sniper by Ryan Green. True terrifying story of Charles Whitman. Ryan Green, he's written a lot of true crime books. We've used a few of his. I know 
the last one we used was a Sylvia Likens episode. Ah. So we're actually starting off at the incident, and Nicole did help me with a story, so she'll be chiming in. What exactly did you research for the story? I just watched the movie again. Oh, you watched the movie? Yeah. Yeah, because you, you had already seen the movie before. Yes. So I thought, I mean, you might as well just watch it again. And that movie was mostly um, eyewitness testimony. Yes. So it's not, um, it actually does not talk hardly at all about the shooter. It's all about like the day and the people who were there that day, either getting shot at or going to the scene. Mm. Um, and it's all about like them telling their, their story. Interesting. Well, I guess you can start then since we're actually, I want to start there at the university, the tower. The only thing that I studied or researched was from this documentary, which was so well done. I highly recommend it. It's called The Tower or Tower, and it came out um, in 2016. Um, And so it's all about the accounts from that day. So the story actually starts off with Claire Wilson, who um, it talks about her story. And there's an actress playing her in the animation and her voice and the animations based off the actress but it it it's like it's hard to explain but it's really well done um so she gets out of anthropology class early that day after taking a test so i'm assuming it's summer semester because august 1st would be a little early for the fall semester to start um she gets out of class early that day after taking a test and she gets a coffee at the student union with her boyfriend tom they as they were sitting at the student union, they realized that they knew they had to put a nickel in the meter to avoid getting a pink slip on the car. OK, I like got ticket. Mm-hmm. And they already had two pink slips on the car. And if you get a third, there was some rule that you wouldn't be able to park on campus anymore. So they're like, oh, we got to go put an- another nickel in the meter. That's like the time when I was in college. and I was on crutches because I got hurt playing um, ultimate Frisbee and I was in the handicap part of the parking, like right outside <laughs> of my building because I was on crutches. And um, there's so many good things with the story. You were playing ultimate Frisbee. You were on crutches. <laughs> I got and... hurt and they gave me a ticket. <gasps> Wait, you were parked in the handicap, but you didn't have a handicap pass? No, because I was it was right outside my building. I was only bringing something upstairs to my. Oh, <laughs> whoopsie. I didn't pay it. And I still graduated. <laughs> so. Oh, it was it was like a campus police ticket. Yeah. Yeah. So so this girl and her her boyfriend Tom, um, they are walking to their their car to go put another nickel in the meter and now she is pregnant. She is like 8 months pregnant. She re- she ready to have a baby. Tom was not the father of her child, but she had met him when she was around 6 months pregnant and they like they just were inseparable. Um, at first, he didn't know that she was pregnant and just couldn't tell. If maybe she ate a big burrito for lunch. You know, that type of deal. Get that. Feel that. They're walking to the car. And she felt there was a huge jolt. Mm. Like she had stepped on a live wire. Oh. And she fell to the ground. And she felt the baby in her, you know, normally, especially in eight months, you feel the baby in her stomach. And she said she felt the baby kind of go off to the side and couldn't feel it moving anymore. And Uh she's laying on the ground. Oh, no. And then Ben Tom, her boyfriend, is also laying on the ground. Yeah, Um, one one second. Let me cut in. Jen, if you want to read this, this is a quote from the Ryan Green book. This is about the first victim. Target number one died when a bullet shattered his skull. He'd never drawn a breath of air. He'd never seen the mother who'd nurtured him inside her for eight months. He didn't even have a name. This was the target that Charlie had chosen to start off his massacre. Oh, my goodness. So the baby was the first victim. So he was aiming for the baby. He was aiming for the, the yeah, the pregnant yeah, mom. And oh. shot the baby right in the skull. So so she is a lot, still alive. Claire is still alive. Um, she is calling out to Tom and he is not responding. But she she is losing a lot of blood. Mm-hmm. And they are the first people shot in this incident. Um, She had heard someone had was walking by and said, what are you guys doing on the ground? Like, get up. 
And then that guy who was walking by heard another shot and ran. Charlie's second shot hit Thomas in the chest, missing the heart, but striking enough of the nearby blood vessels to ensure his near instant death. The man toppled over backwards like a puppet that had its strings cut. That was good. Charlie couldn't control which way the corpses flopped, and he'd rather have them all laid out separate than stacked up. And the whole story goes through these little kind of pockets, and it goes back to Claire and her laying on the ground later. Um, It talks then about this young kid who has a paper route, and it's like a very highly desirable route to go around this, this school area. And he had the route for one more day, and his little cousin was riding the bike with him. And they're making deliveries, and they heard a popping sound. They're riding through the university, and then he shot. Mm. He's a kid riding a, his bike on the paper route. Can I interject? What was Charlie's relation to the te- Texas University? That's a really good question. I was actually going to get you to guess do you want to take a guess why he chose that? Was he a rejected student? Well, what's your What's your guess? Well, I was going to say maybe yeah, either a rejected student or someone who like couldn't graduate or had a his had, had an ex girlfriend that went there or something. That, that's a really good guess. He's actually a current or he was a current student. Okay. He wow. actually had a test that day. Oh, it whoa. was a Monday, and I'll ta- and we'll go into the whole day before and the morning of it's kind of like he planned it but most of the stuff he did was very last minute Mm. but no one knows why he chose a monday it may have just been because it was a monday you know and he wanted to start things off on a monday just another manic monday yeah but yeah um yeah so he was a student there he's from florida and i'll get into that but yeah he was a current student there how old was he 25 Mm. Hmm. on the older side Unless he was a grad student. For attending school. Oh. For attending college. I didn't go to my elite school, the University of Phoenix, until I was 27. I know, but you also had served in the military. Had he served in the military or something prior? Maybe. Oh, Mm -hmm. I mean, that would make sense if he he was a sniper. sniper. (laughs) I don't know. The the movie that I watched didn't get into this. I don't know. And this is after... He got out of the military... It was like the start of uh, Vietnam. So, so, but this is not a long time. Well, ha- a couple of years after Kennedy was shot as well. Mm, I don't know when Kennedy was shot. 63, November. The Vietnam War started November 1st, 1955. So he was already out of the military, and we'll get into that. Mm. But this was during the Vietnam War. And just like a lot of veterans... And I know this from personal experience, just because I've seen a lot of the veterans like this. A lot of the veterans come, become pacifist after they get out of the service. Mm. And that's what he was, too. That's not the reason he did this, but he was a pacifist. You well, know, that's odd that he is a pacifist. You know, well, a pacifist, not not like anti-war. Uh, anti-war. I shouldn't say pacifist. Well, I mean, at that time, they were still being drafted as well. Well, the so, Vietnam, yeah. it was different. The Vietnam War was, it wasn't our war you know, right. I, I guess I it was mean, a conflict that we weren't originally involved yeah. in, which um, you can say a lot about today, too. But it wasn't like World War Two, which right. was if we don't join this war, then we're we'll be speaking freaking Russian or Japanese right. or German. And um, I I want to make a recommendation. I don't know if you guys have watched it yet, but the Chicago seven it's on Netflix right now. It's about mm-hmm. um, seven anti-war activists and the the riots in Chicago hmm. and the the court case they were indicted and there was a federal court case about them um a, a con- them having cons- a conspiracy to start riots in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention and I watched it last night it was very well done I I, hmm. I liked it a lot for the Vietnam War mhm hmm. it was it took takes place in 1960 because it was right after Nixon won the presidency. Huh. But, I mean, yeah, the Vietnam War, it's a very interesting, um, very interesting conflict for sure. My dad fought in it. Um, Yeah, I've never really studied it. I used to work with some guys that flew helicopters in it, but... Oh, I guess like your dad, yeah. yeah. And those guys were a trip. And so now the news is starting to pick up on the reports that someone's shooting from the tower. 
there was a police officer, I think his name was McCoy, who was skipping rocks at some water when he heard the call on the radio, all units to the towers. Um, Most people listening thought it was firecrackers, which reminds me a lot of the the Vegas shooter episode that we covered. Mm -hmm. So someone shooting from the tower. The civilians who were hearing this were warned to stay away. But some kids are curious and they're like, let's go see what's happening. And when I say kids, I mean, they're probably in their, you know, 20s and things like that. So students. Or or, and not even people from on campus, but people off campus. They're like going towards the scene. Um, So shots are being fired, not just on the campus lawn. So the tower, they have like a they call it the mall. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the gunman's not just shooting kids on the lawn but he is shooting at windows from across that are across the street from the lawn like people in the co-op building across the way the barber shop like he's shooting so he's way far just shooting to shoot he doesn't have he's not just like spraying bullets but he is shooting at people and Mm -hmm. anyone a couple really important people in what the story that I kind of looked at was one is someone who heard it on the radio and says, hey, let's go check this scene out. Mm -hmm. Um, He's going to become important later. Um, Another is the man who worked at the co-op across the street. He actually saw the kid on the bicycle get shot. And so he actually, well, he doesn't know that he shot by a sniper at first. He thinks like, are these kids, is he being circled because there's a fight? Mm -hmm. Like, is that why there's blood on the ground? Mm -hmm. So he goes out and he realizes that this kid is shot and he comes, goes to go help out. Um, And then he realized that there's a shooter from the tower. Mm -hmm. And eventually he makes his way to the tower. And the initial point of that is so that he can call his wife and tell his wife that he's okay. Okay. But he becomes very important in the takedown of the shooter. And he's not a cop. He's just a kid. He is. No, this is. So there's a store owner, the store, what the store worker at um, the co-op is okay. the, is one of the people who take down the shooter. Yeah. And this is Texas, too, which is weird. You would think everyone had a rifle on them. So it was a scene of chaos, right? People, and it's not a spray of bullets, so, but there's like pops, pops, pops. He's he's picking people out and shooting at them. And so people are, every now and then, when they think he's at another part of the tower, they try to go and like pick people up and take them to an ambulance mm-hmm. and things like that. Right. So it's chaos for quite some time. And so that's how this the co-op store worker eventually makes it to the base of the tower and the police officer McCoy, he eventually makes it to the base of the tower. And there was a couple of students who, um, once McCoy gets to the campus who have rifles, they've got some big weapons and they start shooting at the sniper too, but they never really got a good vantage point. Officer Martinez also gets the call and makes his way towards uh towards the university of texas in Mm -hmm. austin meanwhile so the news reports are going a single engine small plane flies by and they try to get a shot at the sniper so they can take him down they can't get a good shot now going back to uh claire who her her unborn child was the first victim of the texas scene a woman you know she's losing a lot of blood it's a hot day in Texas. Mm-hmm. It is 100 degrees out, Ooh. and her skin is burning on the pavement. Oh, my gosh. And she heard someone say from a distance that they needed to save the pregnant woman, because she's visibly pregnant. Right. Um, even from far away. Well, and, yeah, she's eight months along. So right? Yeah, very far. And someone says they need to go help help her, you know, and they need to help the pregnant lady. Someone else responds, we need to help save only the people who we can help. Um, and so eventually a woman named Rita ran over to her and lays on the ground next to her and just starts talking to her, um, trying to make sure she stays conscious, Mm -hmm. um, asks her about Tom, you know, who unfortunately is dead next to her. Uh, and eventually one of the boys who heard the call from on the radio, the news radio and said, I'm going to go check this out. 
eventually works up the guts to help carry go into the line of fire mm-hmm. and carry Claire mm-hmm. out of harm's way and into an ambulance. Mm. So he is one of the the heroes of the story for sure. Now, there's a couple of police officers, only a couple who actually make their way to the Texas um, tower. Mm-hmm. Alan Crum, um, Alan actually has a shotgun. McCoy has a shotgun, but Officer Martinez only has a 38 caliber with him. Mm, okay. So he's not very adequately armed Mm-mm. at this point. Right. So they're, the sniper's already shooting for a good hour and a half at this point. Mm-hmm. And they make their way to the tower. They climb up the stairs. And this is where they find even more victims um, that are dead in the first floors of the tower. So... Alan Crum, again, he is the co-op worker who was only going to go into the building to call his wife. Mm-hmm. He's got his gun with him, though. Martinez actually originally thought that he was just an unclothed policeman. Uh-huh. And they're, they're climbing up to the tower. At first, it's just the two of them. And Alan says to Martinez, you better deputize me if we're going to go in here and do this. And he's like, oh, shit, I thought you were a cop. All right. <laughs> Yep, I, 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 I'll deputize you or whatever. So they're they're ready to go, and McCoy then gets there. So it's three guys, and Martinez again. He's woefully inadequate with the, only his thirty eight caliber. Mm-hmm. So they make their way to the third or the the top floor of the tower, and one of them, I think it was Crum, the non police officer. Um, they start to fan out and one of them shoots into a wall to like divert the attention mm-hmm. of the shooter. Right. And Martinez then turns the corner and he empties the his entire barrel of his thirty eight at the sh- sniper. Mm-hmm. Did he hit him? He hits him. He empties his entire barrel. He just shoots. He's like, holy shit, this is it. I mean, he is a, they're all young police officers at right. this point. He empties his barrel and... And McCoy, the other police officer, is behind him. He just grabs McCoy's shotgun from him, shoots him with the shotgun as the sniper is falling to the ground, Mm -hmm. just to be sure that he kills him with a much more sturdy gun. Right. And from there, it's over. They've killed him, and Alan Crum is waving, like, his handkerchief so that they know... um, Not to shoot him. Not to shoot. Now, at first, the, the news reports say... It is the sniper that's like waving his flag, but mm-hmm. then they realized that it was actually police because they they could hear multiple gunshots coming from upstairs mm-hmm. in the tower. Mm-hmm. So this is the photo of him being shot. Oh my goodness, Whitman dead on the tower, and I'll put that on talkmurder dot com. So if you guys want to see that, be sure to go to talkmurder dot com. The documentary was a very powerful story of like people coming together in the goodness of what people can do in such a tragic Mm -hmm. situation. It was very moving because then they actually bring out the, they flash to the actual people telling their story. Oh, wow. Oh man. It's pretty great. It's pretty great. I'm going to talk about the background and the motivation for why Charlie Whitman wanted to do this in the first place. But before we dive into that, I want to just tell you what he told his psychiatrist a few weeks before he actually pulled this off. He told the school psychiatrist that he was seeing, quote, sometimes I think about going up the big tower in the middle of campus with a deer rifle and shooting people, end quote. And the psychiatrist said. He upped his medications. That's what happened. (laughs) But, But. Sounds about right. Yeah, he probably should have did more than that. I mean, it's also but the he, time of yeah. NIMBY and, yeah. you know. In all fairness, the psychiatrist did say, and we'll read a little bit from the psychiatry report, but he did say that um, when they asked him why he didn't do anything about it is because he gets students every day coming in. Tell, telling him that they want to commit suicide and it's all about the tower. They want to jump off the tower because that tower is just, you know, it's, it's, huge. it's huge and it's just there. And from up there in the top of the tower, you can see 360 view vantage point. There's 
tourists that go up there. They come to Texas just to go up there to look at the scenery. It's always that just big structure that's lurking. So anytime a student's depressed, that's the first thing he's going to think about because that's the first thing he sees in the morning and the last thing he sees at night before he goes to bed. It's just there, mm. you know, overlooking. It's, like the, a, it's a prominent. Yeah. Yeah. It's overlooking figure. everything. So you get up there and you feel, you know, bigger than yourself. And so he does get a lot of people that come up there and say stuff like that. But he didn't think it would actually happen. Until it did. Yeah. Charlie was born on June 24th, 1941. He was the eldest of two other boys, Patrick and John. And as soon as he was old enough to pull back the trigger of a rifle, he was out hunting squirrels. His dad was very demanding Mm. and got him into hunting at an early age and expected just the best that his sons could do. So everything that they do from now on has to be perfect or they're going to get the belt. He was always up at the crack of dawn. And at first he actually hated killing animals and, you know, not deer yet, but little squirrel and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Then he just kept doing it over and over and over and over and over again until it got where it didn't even matter. Like desensitized. Yeah, he was desensitized. Because his dad made him go out there and and shoot? Yeah, at the very early morning, every morning. Mm -hmm. He was also a very talented piano player. And he would play piano, but it wasn't for enjoyment. His dad would put the belt on top of the piano. So he knew that if he missed any notes, he would get hit. His dad dad beat his children and his wife, which we're going to get to here in a second. Sounds like a great guy. The father would shower the kids with material things if they if they like check all of his boxes. Mm. If they're the perfect son and they make no mistakes, he would literally love them. But if not, he would just beat them. Charlie was actually a genius at uh, tested IQ 138 Mm. when he was in grade school. And he was actually really popular as well. He, He was he was a star pitcher on the baseball team. He played football. He was in the Boy Scouts of America, which his dad pretty much pushed him in and made him do. But he was the youngest one in the world at the time to become an Eagle Scout. Wow. Wow. He also got the God and Country Award, which apparently is a big thing. It's like a huge thing. Wow. And this is while he's 11 and 12, 13 years old. He's doing all this. He's accomplishing all of this stuff. He had perfect grades. He was the perfect kid. And he attends the Cardinal Newman High School in West Palm Beach. The family lives in Florida, in the West Palm Beach area in okay. Florida. Mm-hmm. And the dad is a businessman. He's actually a self-contracted plumber. But, you know, he considers himself a businessman. I guess he does own his own business. But, you know, everything was good for Charlie if he was living the outline that his dad had laid out for him and he had to be doing everything to a T. You know, his dad wanted him to go to a certain college in Florida. His dad wanted him to go to business school. And that was his path. He was going to do that. And remember, he's the oldest son. The father did not accept any mistakes at all. He strived for perfection at all times. And he was also a a wife beater. Mm. So Charlie's mom and she'll come up later in the episode but she received a lot of the abuse at home Mm. this is from the ryan green book he took note of margaret's failings long before he saw fault in his sons and he applied what he considered to be a very reasonable amount of corrective discipline she didn't go out for a few days after that preparing beautiful meals out of leftovers rather than running to the store the quality didn't decline and the bruises faded before anyone could take note of them Margaret's smile didn't falter. She was still the perfect wife in every respect. So she's getting abused. The kids are getting abused, even though they're freaking perfect kids. And how many kids were there in total? There were three. So he was the oldest, followed by Patrick, which Patrick is the golden boy. Mm. When the mother and the father get divorced, Patrick's the only one that chose the father's side. And then John, the baby, you know, the, the youngest son is just like Charlie, like can see that his dad's a monster, Hmm. that his dad beats his wife and stuff like that. And he leaves home 
just like Charlie did. Charlie left in the middle of the night. But wow. Patrick is different. He is the golden boy. W- once Charlie leaves the nest, the father will latch on to Patrick. And you'll see, you know what I'm saying? Almost yep. to spite. Almost to spite. Yeah, it's it's a very, um, I don't know, That's screwed rough. up family. Yeah. The mother actually had to sneak behind her husband's back to deliver the kids any love or compliments whatsoever. You know, she couldn't be like, oh, you're, you're doing so good at piano. It sounds so amazing. If the dad was there, mm-hmm. he would have to be outside mowing the lawn while Charlie's playing piano. And then she can give that love to him. The mother was a really good person from all accounts that I've seen. She was getting abused at home, but still sticking up for the kids. So something really important about Charlie's personality is he cannot handle stress well. And he puts too much on his plate hmm. and gets overwhelmed. And we're all like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like that Amen. like a month ago, two months ago. You put too much on your plate and then it finally all comes to a halt right at the same time. Mm-hmm. And you can't do shit, you know, because you just, you're just like paralyzed. Yeah. <laughs> and he did that. He piled up a lot on his plate because think about it, at the time he was on the baseball team. He was on the football team. He was an Eagle Scout. He was not only an Eagle Scout, but he was winning all these awards. He would show up all the other Eagle Scouts because he's been hunting since he was a kid. Mm. Since he was old enough to pull back a rifle trigger, he was out shooting squirrels. Mm. So he goes and joins the Boy Scouts and he's like, this is easy. Yeah, I know how to catch a fish. I know how to tie these knots. You guys don't know how to do this yet. You know, all these older Shows kids. Them all up. Yeah, he shows them all up, and he's going to do that throughout the story. But he was putting so much on his plate, even in grade school. You know, he had to get the best grades. He had to do all this stuff. He can handle the pressure well until it all just overwhelms him at the same time. And that's what happened right before this. It was another instance where it just overwhelmed him, and he snapped. But this time he he took it out on all these innocent students Mm -hmm. and, you know, passerbys. This will explain the family dynamic perfectly. It was his 18th birthday, and like all of us sitting at this table, we got drunk as shit on our 18th birthday. Mm, that was 21st birthday. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about that. Mine, we, um, it was, uh, we rented a hotel room at the Copley Plaza downtown. Ooh. And um, it was my closest friends, like four of them, and it was a blizzard actually that uh-huh. evening and my friends were very determined they needed to uh, pull a hay mister and ask somebody to buy us a bottle of Smirnoff for oh, my birthday and they were successful wow. they got somebody off the street oh, in the middle of a blizzard at the Copley Plaza to buy us a I bottle d- of Smirnoff I, that's actually pretty cool I'd do that man I'm not gonna lie I believe that night the uh, <laughs> the fire alarm went off if I recall correctly actually I do remember I don't remember like what I did at night with my family but I do remember going to breakfast with my sister and two of my friends that I worked with at Subway and I like bought a scratch ticket and oh, did Oh yeah, I did that too. Something else that you yeah. can only do when you turn 18. I don't remember what. Cigarettes. Was... No, I didn't buy I cigarettes. Buy, bought cigars. Charlie's 18th birthday. This will tell you a little bit about how the dad is. He gets drunk, Charlie does, and he goes to a party. Now Charlie is extremely popular. Not like John Perry popular. No, it wasn't that popular. I was popular because I had an older brother that was cool. So I got into all the older parties, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I say parties. I got into the older parties and, you know. Even though you were called Little P. His 18th birthday, Charlie goes to a party and gets drunk. And he actually shows up about an hour late past his curfew. Now his dad is usually, now his father is usually out sleeping he's got to get up early in the morning and mind his business but he was by the pool so the father was out by the pool sitting on one of the pool chairs and the son comes walking back up smelling like beer wobbling and the father immediately stands up and this is what happens this is from the book from ryan green if you want to read this he didn't remember the next few punches nor the dozen or so after that Everything was getting dark around the edges. The glow of the moon above was starting to fade. 
Once he was down on his knees, he thought it would be over. But then Charles Sr. kicked him in the ribs and knocked what was left of the air out of his lungs. He lay there gasping hopelessly while his father looked down on him in absolute sneering disgust. Then that same boot lashed out again and tumbled him into the pool. He kicks him in the pool. Now, Charlie is unconscious at the time, and the father leaves him out there to drown in the pool. And this is like one in the morning, two in the morning. And Charlie, as soon as he hits the bottom of the pool, he actually hits his head on the metal ladder. Ooh. to climb up the pole and that kind of wakes him up enough to notice that he is drowning and sucking in water in his lungs and he crawls out barely he almost died the dad wasn't even out side when he does get out of the pool he had already went to bed like he knew his son toppled over in the pool and just left so that's the dad for you so this was kind of the last straw now, Charlie's been wanting to leave, and this was definitely the last straw. There's only one problem, and he'll think about this more later, but right now he's just got to get out of the house. If he leaves, then the mother is going to get even more abuse because the eldest son, who was under the control of the complete and domineering father, is now saying, I don't need you. I'm out. Mm-hmm. You know, Not only that, but he's breaking that plan that the father's laid out for him the college and the business school and the work for yourself all that that the father has laid out for him he just says screw it and he one night walks out he packs a few things this was july 6th 1959 is when he signed his name to the marine corps he basically Mm -hmm. goes to the recruiting office and says sign me up right now and back then they would pretty much i mean they'll take anyone okay yeah (laughs) they still will no what i'm trying to say is well now you have to have a certain score on the asvab yeah so really but back then you could go to the recruiting office and then that evening be on a bus to paris island or wherever yeah basic training wherever you're going Mm. obviously it's not like that now i can't go to a recruiting office and then be on a bus because i got to take the asvab and all that what's the asvab it's a placement test, essentially. They, what they do is they score you, and each branch has a minimum score that you have to reach, and it kind of tells you what kind of jobs you qualify to do in hmm. the Interesting. branch. Interesting. I thought about joining the reserves briefly last week. What? Why? I last thought- week you thought about this? <laughs> what uh, the fuck? I don't know. <laughs> like, I thought you were going to say, like, when you were 18, <laughs> when you were having your drunken birthday moment. No, no, no. Well, I did think about going into the Army when I was younger. You don't um, want to Cadet do that. Kelly, yes. Cadet Kelly, We've discussed. yes. No, I and then last week we were talking about ASVAB and what um and if anything be a cop. Well, like I'm this. not gonna do it. Ninety nine. Yeah. Yes. I'm not gonna do it. I'm just saying I was like, Well, I could do the reserves maybe, like then I'd have to exercise and like also get paid. Maybe they'd Ugh. forgive my loans. Like there are benefits, but I was Once like, No, it, too much too much to first weekend, too much on your plate. First weekend of every month, you gotta go to yeah, until you got to go to something? freaking Afghanistan for 13 to 16 yeah. months. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. Yeah, no. I mean, it was I'll one weekend that. a month. That or isn't it, it, really it the could case. be like South Korea We're based on the current state and of the, things. And the, um, the reserves, man, they go over there forever. They'll yeah. stay over there for like two years. It's two years of your life. Yeah. We'll be rich and famous by the time you get back. He's on the bus that evening to go to his basic training and... His father finds out and tries to contact the federal government mm. to get his son back because he's a you know businessman. He's helped the community out and all this stuff. He's like, you guys need to send my son back, and they wouldn't. They're like, you know, he's an adult. He signed his name, and he's in the Marines. He's ours. And he was actually a fantastic, fantastic marksman. Obviously, I mean, he's a you know sharpshooter. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So he's been hunting all his life. They do a different test than we do. We have 40 targets to shoot, or mm-hmm. at least when I was in. Yeah. And then your rank would be based on how many of those targets you shoot. Theirs are a little different, but they still classify him as a sharpshooter, which, you know, is still the majority of targets. So I asked Jen earlier why he decided in Texas, and this is the reason. He's such a great shooter and a good soldier, mm-hmm. because think about it. He has been abused, and not only that, but he is waking up at 4.35 o'clock in the morning, every morning since he was a child, he was hunting before school. He was in the Boy Scouts, the Eagle Scouts. He was abused at home. He was beat violently, 
punched over and over by his father. Basic training is a cakewalk to someone like that. Right. That's nothing compared to what he went through. So he was a fantastic soldier. Or I guess they don't call him soldiers. Marine. He was a fantastic Marine. So the Marine Corps gave him an opportunity of a lifetime, and that was to go to officer training school. Ah. But the only... That's a big deal. Yeah, it's a really big deal. But to be an officer, you need college. And so they gave him a fantastic offer here. They said they'll pay for his college. I mean, I know they do that, but it's hard to to get this program if you're already active duty. Mm. So he is active duty serving his time. And they told him that he can, while he's active duty, go to college full time, be a full time student. And that's his job. Wow. It's Yeah. There's to have that component to it. Is yeah. Very. Unusual. Yeah. There was. I only knew one guy that that happened to in the army. He was. He literally didn't even show up to formation anymore. He was just a student. You know, that happened to like us. Like I went to like a three week and four week course where we didn't have to show up. But I'm talking about four years. They sent him to college for four years. That counted towards his active duty. Yeah. Wow. That's unusual. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Because my re- cousin did the the officer training school after he enlisted. I think it counted towards his time. So I, I don't know. I didn't see that. Normally, though, isn't it you you enlist, you go to school, and then you have to pay the army back four years? Not pay him back financially, but like with four years of service. Isn't that how it works? Yeah, um, yeah. If you go straight y- into school. Right. But usually yes. you can't go sign up because you sign up enlisted, which is what he did. Mm-hmm. People that do that sign up as an officer, future officer. So Charlie was actually active duty enlisted, and then they gave him the opportunity. I don't know if that counted towards his time or not, but it is kind of rare to see someone who signs up as an enlisted soldier and get accepted to officer training school while they're enlisted and then basically get pardoned from their service until they complete their school, or at least a majority of their school enough to get into officer training school, which is what he was doing. So that is actually how he chose Texas. When he leaves his house that one faithful night when he just walked out, he not only left his dad, the monster, which he never wanted to see again, he left his mom. And his mom, the one that he loved and she loved him and always stuck up for him, now he knows that she is getting it twice as worse since he left. But I thought they were divorced. No, no, not they're yet. not divorced. Not yet. Okay. They're not divorced yet. The That's, kids just leave. The kids just leave the nest. Oh, okay. Charlie, the oldest son, 18 years old, leaves after his 18th birthday, signs the Marine, like in the middle of the night, leaves and signs up for the Marines. So think about it. The dad who has been, you know, pushing his son to be the best he can be and it has his whole life laid out for him, just leaves in the middle of the night and joins the Marines, the dad definitely took all that anger out on the mom, the the punching bag that's right there, you know. Now, this is kind of when he starts feeling like he shouldn't have just left because his mom is now getting beaten Mm -hmm. even worse than before. And this is the reason he chooses Texas, because he wanted to go to California to get away from that monster the farthest he can go in the Marine Corps to get away from that monster at home, his father, the one that beats him, is in California. But he also wants to be somewhere where he's accessible to his mother if she gets beaten so bad one night and he needs to come home. So that's when he decides Texas, right in the middle of where he wants to be, farthest away from the monster, and close enough to his mother that he could still come home on holidays and stuff and kind of, you know, make sure everything is okay. That's how he decided Texas. Now, this is very important because if you haven't seen the Texas tower that we're talking about, the one he got up, um, I'll put in a picture on talkmore.com or you can just Google it. It's a very commanding looking tower. So that's the campus around it. And the campus is in this tower okay. as well. Mm-hmm. And then the campus buildings are on there. Mm-hmm. So the tower, what you're looking at now, is very, like when you go to the University of Texas, like that's what you see. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So like, but it's kind of like. This the... is, a, is a better picture of it. Okay. 
the first thing you do is see that tower. It it encompasses everything in the university. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of like the bell um the bell tower at Quinnipiac. Like we have a bell clock hmm. by the library. Yeah, it is and a that's clock first. tower. Yeah, clock tower. Yeah, yeah, yeah clock tower. But so we can't. We could never go up it. Huh. In September 1961, that was his first day of college. He was going for mechanical engineering, you know, with the it Marines. It was his first day? The first day, yeah. In ni- 1961, not oh, 1966. Oh, oh, sorry. I yeah. thought you were saying it, the day he shot up the school. No. So this was, no, this was five years before Got the sh- shooting up. So September 1961 is the first day he walks into the University of Texas on the campus and sees the tower. Five years later, August 1966, he'll be on that tower shooting the life out of anyone that he can see. Since then, he has been up on that tower numerous times. He's always up there. It's I mean, all the students go up there and tourists go up there. People touring the campus, people new to Austin, they all go up there to look around. You know, it's a tourist attraction. So if you want to read this, this is from Ryan Green's book. When his cohorts noticed Charlie staring up at it like a tourist, they started to poke fun at him. But his response came back to that military mindset once again. A single man could hold off an army from up there. Hmm. I mean, it's true. That's the first thing I would think, too, when I went up there. It's the first thing I think about when I see that. Because you always want to be on the top of the anthill, you know. Not me. I had a really bad run in with some ants this past summer, so I am going to stay as far away from ant hills as possible. I still have scars on my feet. So at school, he meets his future wife, Kathleen Leesner. She's a trainee school teacher. Her father is very wealthy, and the father is paying for anything his daughter wants to do. You want to go be a teacher? You want to be an artist? Whatever, I'll pay for it. You're just my little princess. Princess. They soon get married, and that's when it really, really hits them that Charlie's mother, because the mother and dad came to the wedding, they didn't want to be there. The dad didn't want to be there, you can tell. And then they leave early. They didn't pay for anything. It was just like, oh, yeah, here's your wife. You know, I got to go or whatever, you know. So that's when he really started saying, oh, my God, you know, my mom is getting beaten at home Mm -hmm. like crazy. This is the point where... She's not even defending herself anymore. She's letting it happen. Yikes. So that's how bad it is. Six months after Charlie marries Kathleen, they start having problems. And that's when he first hits her. Ooh. So here's what happens. He's back in school and the stress is piling up again. He's now married. You know, he's got to keep his grades up. He wants to get a part-time job, stuff like that. So it starts piling up. He hits her from here on out. It's the road of abuse, obviously. Mm. And the first time he does it, you know, he's like, oh, my God, I'm becoming the monster of the the monster dad that, you know, raised me. Mm. His grades start going downhill and they get so bad, which is like a C, which is great for me. But if you're getting paid... C's get degrees. Yeah. (laughs) He starts getting C's, C average student. The Marines don't like that. They cancel that program for him. They're like, you you know, you failed. Because he has to, if you're, if the Marines are paying for it, you You got to like maintain a certain grade. An honor student, like B or an A. Yeah. Again, if you fall below that, then you're done, son. Mm -hmm. So he was done, son. Now, his wife is in Texas. They're living together in Texas. They're newly married. She's a teacher, like an assistant teacher, bringing in a little money, you know. And now he gets sent back to North Carolina in Camp Lejeune after he fails out of college. Mm -hmm. You know, his grades get so low that the Marines snatch him back out. Not only that, he's no longer going to officer school. Oh, no. So you can, kind of, you can start to see he's the down, downward spiral, right? Yeah. Now, he only comes and sees his wife on holiday. So he comes back to Texas to see his wife. So the whole time, he's thinking, oh, my God, maybe she's cheating on me. Maybe she's thinking that, you know, why did she marry a guy like me? Because they're brand new engaged right and married like clearly didn't know each other for very long yeah either. they didn't know each other for very long i feel like that was a thing back then they didn't get married fast yeah yeah 
Charlie's very self-conscious and he puts a lot on himself. Well, yeah, because his whole life he was made to live up to his father's expectations. So when he gets back to the Marines, he starts noticing that he has no motivation. He doesn't want to be that star Marine anymore. He could care less. His life sucks and he just wants to get out. He also wanted to start making a little more money so he can go visit his wife more often, and he found gambling. And he liked gambling a lot, but what he liked more was actually loan sharking the other Marines' money to gamble with. And someone had owed him, it was like $15, like a very small sum. Mm -hmm. But Charlie thought he was going to go bully this guy because he hasn't been paid yet. Like he's some sort of, you know, loan shark, like the mafia shark or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like the Russian, the Russian guy from Limitless. Yeah. So he was going to go bully this guy and he pulls out a 25 caliber pistol, which is not registered to him on the base. You can't just have a pistol if it's not registered. Right. And he pulls it out and threatens this guy with him. He gets a court martial for that. He was arrested and he was busted back down to private. Oof. So things Whoa. are going way downhill. Yikes, son. Yeah. Things ain't looking good for you. So exactly. I mean, this was a star Marine and now he has just failed out of college. You know, and in the back of his mind, it's not so much that all this is happening. It's the fact that he thinks that his father was right all along. Mm. You know, if I, if I wouldn't have ran away from home, if I would have did his plan... You know, I would have had a happy life. He just doesn't want to face that fact that life just sucks sometimes. Yeah. He finally gets out of the Marines, moves back to Texas, and things are going good for a little bit. But then in February 1966, which is six months before, Mm -hmm. the mother calls the son on the phone and says, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I got my stuff packed. My bags are packed. Come get me. And drive me back to Texas. Okay. So now he's taking care of the mom, oh, too. Oh, no. And the, the father, I mean, think about the father. Okay. He's had complete control over this family. He made all the money and all this stuff. Now, Charlie gets out of the Marines, and his wife is the breadwinner, because mm-hmm. this guy is, I mean, for instance, he's a uh, an admin guy at Central Freight Lines. He's got a part-time job as a surveyor. He's a bill collector, like one of those people that come up, you you know, what do they say? You've been served. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of those guys. Yeah. Like in Pineapple Express. Yeah. So he's doing these menial, just awful jobs. His wife is making all the money. Not only that, the mother now comes down and he's got to get an apartment for his mother. And the father would pay for it. But, you know, he's going to have to know where it's at. Right. And that's the type of father he is. He's not going to pay for it unless he knows exactly where she's at. They're not about to tell him where it's at because he would just come down and beat her. And not only that, but he's out of the Marines again and he wants to go back to school, even though he failed out the first time. And now he's got to pay for it himself. How so, is he going to do that with these little jobs? Exactly. How would you do it? You would go back and ask your dad. So you see the dad is just completely winning life right now because everything in charlie's life he just wanted to get away from it but then he finally realizes he can never get away from it the dad's got the tentacles that just pull you back in Mm -hmm. so now it's college money and the dad is happy to pay for it very happy because he's in control he he gets some more control yeah not only that but he wanted to change his major from mechanical engineering to architecture Mm -hmm. which this guy doesn't even draw he's not even an artist and the dad was it's quite the leap. The dad, if it was in any other circumstance, he would have blown up. Yeah, you know, hit his wife, punched him. But now he's got that extra control over his family again. So he's like, sure, I can pay for it. All along, this guy's just getting more in burdened and in debt to his father. You you see how it's yeah. like he's in this hole that he can't get out of. So. Around that point, now this is right leading up to the murder, he goes and visits a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist gives him dexedrine, which are barbiturates, and back then they were called goofballs. Oh. And eventually he starts taking Valium, so he gets energy to focus during the day, but then this guy's got a rage problem, and the psychiatrist noted that. 
he's got a very violent streak, a rage problem. So we gave him Valium to calm him down. Mm. It's the worst combination. Also around this time, he started writing notes to himself. He would write these little sticky notes and leave them everywhere. For instance, some of the notes would say, Stop procrastinating. Control your anger. Smile. It's contagious. Don't be belligerent. Stop cursing. Improve your vocabulary. Approach a pot of gold with exceptional calls. These sound like notes I need to write myself. (laughs) (laughs) These seem like valuable life lessons. A lot of the notes revolved around kind of in a subtle way not to beat your wife. Mm. You know, control your anger. You know, think before you act. Yeah. Basically, don't hit your wife. And you can tell he uh, hated the fact that he hit his wife. Mm. Um, Like one of them says, be gentle in all caps. Well, it's kind of sad. Yeah. But at least he's trying. I know. Until he snapped, apparently. The psychiatrist wrote that there's no signs of psychosis. Now, I want to say I'm putting all these sources, the psychiatrist notes... His diary entries, because he wrote in a diary and everything else. I'm putting all those sources on talkmurder.com. Be sure to go there. There is a labyrinth of information there if you want to dive deeper in this case. The psychiatrist wrote that there was no signs of psychosis, but he did say that, quote, sometimes I think about going up the big tower in the middle of campus with a deer rifle and shooting people. It's so interesting that... (laughs) That nothing was done at that point, because if something like that Mm -hmm. was said today and the psychiatrist did nothing, they could be found liable. Yeah. Mm. The psychiatrist also noted that he had hypergraphia. You want to guess what that is? Something to do with the writing. Yeah. The uncontrollable impulse to write, Hmm. which I think Stephen King has that. Alexander Hamilton probably had that. Yeah, because he wrote all the Federalist Papers. Mm hmm. Around this time, he maps out his plan. Now, his plan is sloppily carried out, which we'll talk about here in a second. But there's a few things he couldn't leave. For for instance, he can't leave his wife. Did they have any kids? No, they didn't have any kids. But he can't leave his wife feeling that, you know, she may have been the problem that caused this or anything. So if you want to read this, this is from the book. There were logical reasons why Charlie couldn't simply kill himself. Margaret would fall back into the arms of Charles Sr. if he were taken out of the picture. And while Kathy would be well taken care of by her parents, he would still be annihilating the version of her that lived here and now with him. He could only imagine the grief that she'd feel if she found out he'd ended it all. She might try to follow him into the dark. Either way, it would break her, and he couldn't bear the thought of her broken. So the day before... He drives to his mother's house in the penthouse apartments, and he actually types this note before he leaves. I don't quite understand what compels me to type this letter. Perhaps it is to leave some vague reason for the actions I have recently performed. I don't really understand myself these days. I'm supposed to be an average, reasonable, and intelligent young man. However, lately, I can't recall when it started, I've been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. These thoughts constantly recur, and it takes a tremendous mental effort to concentrate on useful or progressive tasks. So that night, he goes in the middle of the night, he visits his mother. Now, she was, you know, she didn't know who was knocking on the door that late. She finally sees that it's him, it's Charlie. Okay, I'm going to let him in. And then instead of coming up for a hug, he starts coming in for the choke. He's going to choke and kill his mother. Ooh. She'd never been stabbed before, but she'd been punched plenty of times, and that was what it felt like Charlie had done to her. Punched her right in the chest and driven all of the air out of her body. She tried to draw in a breath, but it just wasn't working. She let out a little gurgle, then looked down at the blossoming red stain on her nightdress, and the hilt of the knife stuck between her ribs. She fell to her knees, all power in her body fleeing in the rush of blood. Charlie made no attempt to meet her eyes as he tugged the knife out of her chest. The time for emotional connection was long gone. He was cold now. Cold in a way that she'd never seen him. So he can't just kill himself. He's got to kill his mom because because if he kills himself, the mom is just going to go back to the dad. And he can't let that happen. He's also got to kill his wife Mm. because he can't have her, you know, not understand why he did this the whole time. So the note that he wrote 
and left by his mother's corpse, says, quote, To whom it may concern, I have taken my mother's life. I am very upset about having done it. However, I feel that if there is a heaven, then she is definitely there now. And if there is no life after, I have relieved her of her suffering here on earth. The intense hatred I feel for my father is beyond description. My mother gave that man the 25 best years of her life, and she finally took enough of his beatings, humiliation and degradation and tribulations that I'm sure that nobody but she and he will ever know. He has chosen to treat her like a slut that you would bed down with, accept her favors, and throw a penance in return. Mm. He's very elaborate in his writing style. Yeah, he actually knows the mother's routine in the morning. For instance, when the mother gets up, she has a little, uh, you know, side job mm -hmm. working in a, a little grocery or something. He always knocks on the neighbor's door. Door. His name is Roy. Mm -hmm. And the reason we know that is because he even leaves a note at the mother's door for Roy. So when Roy doesn't hear the mother knocking at the door, he won't get all worried because ah. he's still got, you know, the whole morning to get through right. before he can get to the tower. And the, the note says, it says, Roy, I don't have to be at work today. And I was up late last night. I would like to get some rest. Please do not disturb me. Thank you, Miss Whitman. So he even wrote that death note for his mom. It's wow. just it's so weird. So after he kills his mom, he goes back to his house. Now it's probably 334 in the morning at this point. The wife, Kathleen, is still asleep, and this is what happens. This is from the book. He drew his knife and carefully positioned it above the familiar freckles on her chest. The tip hovered there for as long as he could hold it steady, until it started to wobble and waver. He knew then that there could be no more delay. He didn't stab her. He threw his whole weight onto the pummel of the knife. Which is the back end. It slipped into her heart without even touching her ribs. The guard slammed into her chest so hard that it left a perfect indentation in the same shape. Her last breath exploded out from between her lips, but her eyes never opened. Charlie never had to see the fear and the pain he dreaded. She peacefully died in her sleep. So he kills his wife. He leaves a note. It says, I imagine it appears that I brutally killed both of my loved ones. I am only trying to do a quick and thorough job. If my life insurance policy is valid, please see that all the worthless checks I wrote this weekend are made good. He went out and bought a bunch of ammo. Uh -huh. He actually, so right before he writes his letter, he goes to Sears and he buys like a rifle case and a lot of ammo and he buys a shotgun. He also goes to a gun store and buys a, like a high powered rifle, which he uses to, you know, kill. So he's writing all this stuff down and it looks like he planned all this stuff, which he probably did, but he kills both his mother and his wife and then goes and buys all the ammo and then goes and buys the guns, mm -hmm. which is so weird. Yeah, that yeah. Is weird. You know, like you didn't really plan it. He just knew that he'd be able to buy that stuff. I guess there was no gun laws like they are now. Yeah. You know? But because all they did was look at him funny. It's like, why is this guy buying so much ammo? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think there was gun laws. I think this may have started gun laws. Hmm. I want to say because he actually had no plan. He went and bought all the ammo and a lot of ammo and he wrote bad checks and everything for it. Hmm. So anyway, and anyway, it, it goes on to say, please pay off all my debts. I am 25 years old and I have never been financially independent. Donate the rest anonymously to a mental health foundation. Maybe research can prevent further tragedies of this type. Hmm. He goes and he gets on the tower, you know, around 1115 noontime. He that's, goes up there and they, they think he's a maintenance worker. See, that's interesting ah. to me because I feel like, although, I mean, we've covered so many cases at this point, but I feel like this is the first one where like he knew what he was doing, but he knew that it, wasn't right and he didn't want to be doing it mm. what do you mean like well, like the fact that he said that you know he wants the remainder of his life insurance policy to be donated to a mental health you're saying that he knew that he had a mental problem yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and i think that's really interesting and i think that you know it's not, not a lot do yeah yeah i was thinking that too but also i was thinking is it a way to make himself kind of 
look like a victim because he ended up killing 18, 19 people. Yeah. Did he just say that as like a cop out or was he serious? Do you know what I'm saying? That's true. Was it like, I don't want people to think of me when I'm dead 10 years from now as a coward. You know, maybe if they think I just had a mental illness. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think he did really have mental illness. I know what you're saying, but yeah. I kind of got the feeling that maybe it was. Like, know. did he have the wherewithal to actually know that? Yeah. But I mean, either way, at least it, if it did go to the mental health institution um, or for he research. He probably didn't have a lot, to be honest. Well, I mean, it's still pretty. I, I, I hate to say that it was noble of him to donate. Yeah, <laughs> something, that, that, that's what but you know what I mean? Yeah. That's what yeah, I don't yeah. want to say, though, because he like killed so many innocent people right. and like well, i feel like he just wanted people to be like that's no you know what's interesting is like in the in the tower movie it's like it barely mentions him it's yeah. all about the victims which i think is really cool yeah um, that is cool that it's it's only about the the goodness and the i mean a, a lot of tragedy but the the community co- trying to come together take this guy down yeah yeah it's a different take Totally this is a really good take. movie. I'll put the YouTube, the free video, which is the full video, but, you know, someone just uploaded it to their account or whatever. So it may not be up there for long. Yeah, but I'll put that on talkmore.com so you don't have to buy it because it was on Netflix for free and then they took it off. But you definitely want to see that movie. But I think it'd be a good compliment to each other once you hear the backstory and because it, it'd go together because like Nicole said, it doesn't the movie doesn't talk anything about this guy at all. No. They but it, it's really cool. His name. No, uh, they do oh. at the very end, very little. Yeah. So, like, none of this stuff I, I had known yeah. about it, which is really interesting. Hmm. But yeah, that is the Texas Tower Shooter. That is a really densely packed story. I just, I'm, you know, I could sit here and do another episode, but I don't want to. But I hope you guys enjoyed that. Any questions? No. All right. Well, thank you so much, guys, for listening to Talk Murder to Me. My name is John J-O-N. I'm sitting here with Jen, J-E-N, and Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E. And No H, uh, assholes. And until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people.